saying something about an important arrival. Back. My name's Charlotte Phillipson and welcome to another episode of On The Track. Get out of the way, Wally. It's my triumphant return. Well, this is actually one of my favourite parts of the show to do because it's when Charlotte and I sit down and look at videos or photographs that have come in of things that are purported to be unknown animals during the previous month. We haven't had Charlotte for a couple of months and it's great to welcome her back and it's great as well we've got Carl Marshall with us so we've actually got the three of us to sit and wonder at these noisome objects which have been sent to us. First of all is this creature here. This turned up in early June at a place called Staten Island, which is very well known as being the place where ships from Europe would first come in to New York Harbour. And this creature, which apparently was about yay high, yay size, was found washed up on the beach and somebody said is this the new Montauk monster? Now, for those of you who don't know what the Montauk monster was over to Carl. The so-called Montauk monster was the carcass of a small mammal that washed up on a beach uh, off Montauk, in Montauk district off New York State. Um, it was quite close to the Plum Island Animal Disease Centre so this encouraged certain cryptozoologists to become very excited uh, quite unnecessarily I believe as it was quite obvious what this carcass actually was um, it was quite obviously a raccoon well when the original Montauk monster pictures arrived in my email inbox Richard Freeman was here with me and the two of us were very scathing about them I'm afraid we thought that it was obvious that they were some small carnivore which had died and washed up on the beach at Plum Island and the problem was that the fact that it was washed up near Plum Island really caused all the problems. But Richard and I fired off an email saying, oh, it's either a raccoon or I must admit I thought it was a skunk and forgot all about it. But within days, people within the cryptozoological community, who I believe really should have known better, were shouting their mouths off and making great 
pronouncements about this thing and treating it as, as if it was something of real cryptozoological importance, which it wasn't. Even the name Montauk Monster annoys me because, okay, it was Montauk Beach, but it was not a monster. It was a dead raccoon. And furthermore, it was a dead raccoon that had been found dead by a bunch of stone surfer types who decided to give it a Viking funeral, made a makeshift raft for the body and set it on fire before putting it out to sea. It was one of those ideas which probably makes perfect sense when you're wasted. <laughs> yes, Charlotte? <laughs> It makes perfect sense when you're wasted, but it's been a long time since I've been in that condition on a beach, and I but I do recollect the mindset quite well. When the corpse washed up again near Plum Island, a lot of people jumped to unwarranted, though not entirely surprising conclusions, and the legend of the Monthawk monster was born, with several people who really should have known better jumping on the bandwagon. But now, is this another Montauk monster, say the newspapers? Well, I actually know what it is, but first of all, what do you think, Charlotte? Ladies first. Um. Do you think it is a monster from the nether regions? No. Do you think it is something from the deepest pits of hell? No. Do you think it is a construct made by a secret government department out of technology back engineered from the Roswell UFO crash? No. What do you think it is? Small mammal. Carl, what do you think it is? I would say it's most likely a raccoon. Mm -hmm. Right, this, uh, this new Montauk monster is absolutely a raccoon. Um, it's very similar in its basic morphology as the original Montauk monster. If you look at its paws, you can see quite clearly that it's most likely a raccoon. Uh, also, its cranial morphology also indicates this. Um, it's not as rotten as the first one. The first one was very much decayed. Uh, this one's not quite so badly decayed, but it's still getting there. Um, yeah, but I would say that it's most likely a raccoon. I know this sounds like a... you finished scratching yourself? Yes. I have missed this girl. I know that this sounds like it's a digression, but Julius Caesar assembled his 10th legion of his most trusted army officers and his most trusted soldiers to be the legion that he entrusted with special jobs. And after the debacle of the Montauk monster, casting myself in the role of Caesar, I decided to put together my own 10th legion of experts that I can call upon when I'm sent photographs or videos or even specimens that baffle me. And so this team consists of Dr Max Blake, who as you know is an old friend of the CFZ and a regular uh, contributor to this show, to Lars Thomas from Copenhagen, who's another old friend a long-time collaborator of the CFZ and who runs the CFZ uh, laboratory in Copenhagen. Carl Marshall is standing there behind me, who you all know and who is increasingly one of the core members of the CFZ. Plus we have two bone and skull collectors, Rick and Melanie, who I met on Twitter and my stepdaughter Shoshana, who I believe you will all know, is a highly qualified veterinary surgeon. I usually don't say vet, because when I describe her as a vet, my American viewers will then write in saying, hey, did that mean she served in Vietnam? <laughs> oh, come on, it wasn't that bad. I thought it was quite a funny joke, that. <laughs> That's right, you have to laugh when you're prompted. Horrible child. But, having put this team together, I sent off this picture to them, and you know what they all said? Yes, Charlotte, what do you think they said? Raccoon. Carl, what do you think they said? Probably a raccoon. Yep, they all said it was a raccoon, which means it was another Montauk monster. <laughs> but now look at this. This is slightly more peculiar. Only a few days after I first 
contacted my new 10th legion and sent this picture, which is really rather peculiar. This was apparently found in a national park in Nebraska. And I found I didn't actually know where Nebraska was. I knew it was a song by uh, Bruce Springsteen, an album by Bruce Springsteen, but I didn't actually know anything about it, so I had to look it up. Nebraska is a state in the central United States. It's just east of Wyoming. Uh, it's known to have severe thunderstorms, and from what I gather from some rollerbladers I used to know back in the 1990s, it's a very cold state, which has uh, quite severe snow. It turned out there were several pictures of this thing. But first of all, looking at the left-hand side one, Charlotte, what is it? Well, I thought it could be some sort of fox thing, but looking at it next to the croc, it can't be because it's too small, unless it's a young one. Carl? It, it doesn't look like an animal. Its teeth are all wrong. Mm. Um, most likely not an animal at all. And look here, it's only the front half of one, and it's really quite small, as Charlotte says. Now, the story goes that a woman called Andrew Kettleson said that she found it in her home in Martinsburg, 11 miles southwest of the Ponca State Park. Come on, Ponca State Park? Isn't that going to make you laugh? What is that? It's a national park called Ponca. Now, I might be the one who thinks Ponca State Park is a funny name. Kettleson says that her dog dragged the carcass to her home. And... She believes it is a, I'm not going to say any more, because we'll now go over to the people from my 10th Legion. Carino originally said it looked like a kind of golden retriever with a short nose. Shosh wrote, I don't know, something about it just doesn't look real. I think it's a combination of the teeth, fur and nose. And then Gil went on to say, why such a poor photo cutting out most of the body? Well, at that stage, we didn't realise that, the photo, that there was only half the body available. Then Lars wrote, it looks fake to me too, especially the fur, it makes me think of stuffed toys. We got the second and third photograph a few days later, and apparently the woman who found it believes that it is a dead and mutilated raccoon with fur that had become bleached in the sun. However, I'm afraid, or I believe, that although the teeth are superficially similar, the absence of colouration, the pointed nose and the apparently long fur would argue against this hypothesis. Karina wrote, The picture of the woman holding it up, is that its pelvis hanging down? Why would the back end be like that with the front end still having all that fur? She looks jolly happy at the smell. The more I look at it, the more I'm inclined towards Lazar's hypothesis. I think it's the half, front half of a toy lion. But we are going to circulate the photographs to my 10th legion again and I'll let you know what transpires. John, you forgot the bloody Patreon! My late father always said that one shouldn't talk about money because it was vulgar and that the dances were all sorts of things, but we were never vulgar. Well, I don't know if you just saw that earth tremor, but that was probably my dear old father rolling in his grave, because I'm just about to be vulgar. And no, of course I don't mean being here with Wally the Comedy Rhinoceros and the lovely Charlotte, but I'm afraid I'm going to talk about money. A couple of years ago, our friend Louis from Brighton set up a Patreon campaign for us. And Patreon is the easiest and most convenient way that you can support what we're doing here on On The Track and with our other work with the CFZ. So for as little as a pound a month, you can help us do what we do. And yes, there are all sorts of exciting prizes and bonuses which you can get. So why not go along to this address and tell them that Wally the Comedy Rhinoceros sent you.
Now, I've had enough of being vulgar for today. Money bores me. It's the least important thing, and it's certainly not what the CFZ are all about. So, let's get on with the show. Well, we're getting a lot of letters at the moment. Can you do an introduction for the CFZ postbag? Yeah, I'll get on to it. Hey, yeah, wait a minute, Mr. Postman. Well, that was more sensible than I expected. But wait, there's more. Mr. Postman, wait and see. Have you got a message for the CFC? Oi, Posty, this is me instead. Use the Queen's English in the CFC. Oh, bloody hell. I suppose it'll have to do. Regular viewers will remember that some months ago we posted a piece of video which was shot in a bay in Thailand which purported to show some strange humanoid creatures. And that furthermore, whilst we were unable to identify them, the month after we received a letter from a lady called Linda Steele, who I have known on and off for a long time now. She even came along to one of the weird weekends once. And she explained that these pictures were actually of a performance artist in a Thailand beach that had been employed by the local authorities. But, boys and girls, she's done it again. Last month, as I expect you'll remember, we showed some video which was sent to us by a correspondent in Iran. Whereas Karina and Graham both thought that it was a monkey in a weird costume, I was less sure. But guess what? Linda Steele came up with, if not the definitive answer, a damn good pointer towards what it will be. She wrote... Hi John, here is a link to an article from Mysterious Universe talking about the creature from Azerbaijan. They seem to think it may be a small primate in some kind of costume. Apparently the rough Google translation of the blurb which originally accompanied the video on YouTube uploaded by someone in Azerbaijan, although it's uncertain whether this refers to the Republic or the province of Iran, reads In the Corsicus they caught a creature similar to a brownie. Unusual video excited the network. It depicts a strange creature, densely overgrown hair, something that does not resemble any other creature. Apparently, Crypto Monday got word of the video from the well-known Russian cryptozoologist Igor Bertsev, a hominologist and head of the Yeti Institute at Kemerovo State University. Whilst Bertsev did not see the creature in person, he determined that the video was taken in late 2016, but didn't give any clues to what the person in it was saying, nor any speculation on what the creature might actually be. The article went on to suggest that, like Karina and Graham said, this was some primate wrapped in a strange costume but also noted that it was tame enough to have been somebody's pet. But then Carl saw last month's episode. Also on Mysterious Universe, I found an interesting article that may or may not shed some light on this current mystery. The article, by someone called Brent Swanser, which was published in September last year, opens by saying... Out in the desert wastelands of the Lut Desert in the Shalahad region of South Khorasan province, Iran, is a tiny village known as Makuchnik. In the present day it looks very much like any other village in the sparsely inhabited region, and on the surface there might not seem anything strange or remarkable about this place at all. Yet, looking around, you will find elements of Neolithic architecture and tunnels hinting at the area's ancient past. And indeed, lying under this modern village lies something far more ancient and mysterious. More intriguing still is the fact that the ancient structures here, which are still used, all seem to have been built for residents much smaller than modern human beings, possibly constructed for a long-lost race of little people, and earning this mysterious place the nickname Shai Kotala, or the City of Dwarves. 
Apparently, the ancient city had remained buried and forgotten for millennia before being unearthed in the 1940s by baffled archaeologists who until then had not known of their or any other ancient civilization in this particularly bleak and unforgiving desert. The 4th millennium BC ruins were considered a major archaeological discovery, and when studies commenced there in 1948, it was found that the artefacts, tools and furnaces here, as well as the height of the doorways or ceilings, and the width of the tunnels, as well as the numerous stone and clay houses, had apparently been made for inhabitants, estimated to have averaged only around three to four feet in height, a veritable race of tiny dwarves, although no one knows who they were or why they should have been of such a diminutive stature. This is fascinating stuff, and if nothing else, it proves that there is far more to this beautiful and ancient country than the horrors which are reported every day in the world's press. Whether or not these strange dwarves from the deserts on the Pakistan border have anything to do with the creature which has apparently been filmed up in the north of the country, we don't know. But I would like to pass you over to Nigel Tufnell for the last word. No one knows who they were or what they were doing, but their legacy remains. Did you know there's been some comments on last month's video? The CFZ is probably closest in evoking what Jung called the interpersonal unconscious, and they are quite the tellers of folklore and myths. It is quite a treat for me, who is a phenomenologist and philosopher. We were only talking about Carl Jung yesterday, weren't we, Archie? Why don't we look through the round window? They say that a young man's got nothing in the world these days. Because the old man's taken away all of his symbolism and archetypes. Come along, dear. Stop being a poser. You're not much adultery and you're never going to be, you know. Why don't we just go and have a nice cup of tea and wait for it all to blow over? Well, the 13th of June saw a very special milestone. Having been born in 1929, Mother, who, particularly because of this show, has made friends all over the world, celebrated her 90th birthday, and both Archie and the Orange Cat wanted to make sure that they were part of the festivities. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear mother, happy birthday to you. Mighty, mother. Oh. Mighty. I'm ninety. Yes, you're ninety. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Well, you've heard of the old woman who lived in a shoe, but have you ever heard of a shoe with a shrew in it? The other evening, somehow a shrew got into the house and after being chased around the sitting room by Carl brandishing a fishing net and also attracting the attention of several of the cats oh, oh. and Archibald, the little oh, thing oh, took idiot. refuge in one of Mother's oh, shoes, that boy, mate. from whence it was netted no, and gone back in the shoes. Shoes. Apparently none oh, worse the size of it. Yeah. That's a shame it's so dark I can't yeah. see.
I'm very fond of all of my extended family, including the CFZ family, which is often the same thing. But this month I'd like to give a big shout-out to Jessica Braun Phillips, who you will remember is married to my nephew David. Although in these sad days many people would regard them as vermin, she rescued three young field mice that had been playing in her garden and somehow had got into a small puddle and by the time that she retrieved them were half drowned. She dried them, put them into a makeshift cage and fed them for a few days before releasing them again. It is such little acts of compassion like this which give me hope for the human race. For the first 10 or 11 years after I moved back into the house and brought the CFZ with me, we kept the garden roughly the same as it had been when my father was alive. This was partly out of sentiment, and mainly because once a year we laid the house and gardens open for visitors during our regular Weird Weekend conference. But the Weird Weekends went on hiatus in 2016, at least down here, although they do carry on, up in the frozen north under the tutelage of our old friend Glenn Vaudry, and we slowly began to optimise the garden for wildlife. Carl Marshall has been down here working like a Trojan all week, by the way, I've often wondered, am I allowed to say working like a Trojan, or are the present-day inhabitants of the part of coastal Turkey where the city of Troy once stood? Uh, what if some of our viewers don't know what the city of Troy was? Then they're nothing but an ignorant bunch of... That's enough of that, dear. As I was saying, am I allowed to say working like a Trojan, or are the present-day inhabitants of the part of coastal Turkey where the city of Troy once stood going to accuse me of cultural misappropriation or something like that. Oh, uh, I think it's called cultural appropriation. I don't care, it's stupid. Or at least as stupid in most cases and would certainly be in this one. Come on, Carl, put the sword away and stop mucking about with your helmet. Having been bullied into it by my nearest and dearest, because let's face it, everybody's read the Iliad, haven't they? In Greek mythology, the Trojan War was waged against the city of Troy by the Greeks. The war originated from a quarrel between the goddesses Hera, Athena and Aphrodite after Eris, the goddess of strife and discord, gave them a golden apple, sometimes known as the Apple of Discord. All hell discord, yeah. It was marked Callisti for the fairest, yes, Eris, 23, and all that jazz. Oh hell discord, yeah. Zeus sent the goddesses to Paris who judged that Aphrodite was the fairest and she should receive the apple. In exchange, Aphrodite made Helen, the most beautiful of all women, and wife of Menelaus, fall in love with him, who took her to Troy. Menelaus and his posse subsequently declared war on Troy. The war is one of the most important events in Greek mythology and has been narrated through the many works of Greek literature, most notably Homer's Iliad. Troy was a city in the far northwest of the region known as late classical antiquity as Asia Minor, now known as Anatolia in modern Turkey, just south of the southwest mouth of the Dardanelles Strait and northwest of Mount Ida. OK, does that make you happy? Anyway, as I was saying, Carl has been working very busily all week and he is making really great progress with the garden. People who came to the CFZ in the old days will remember that we had a semicircular bath outside the museum in which we kept turtles. Well, the turtles sadly have gone the way of all flesh and the bath had become more and more overgrown and full of stagnant water and rotting leaves until just after Prudence died. Prudence was such a big girl and so bulky and so heavy that Graham and I decided that the best thing to do 
rather than try and dig a grave for her by hand, was to hire a mini digger. And so, as well as digging Prudence's grave, which was a sad but necessary task, he also made room for another small pond, just down from the main pond that we have had in the CFZ garden for some years. Yes, you've guessed it, the bath which once held turtles has now been given a new lease of life. Well, this is the big pit. Soon to become a pond, hopefully. And when Carl was making good with all the piles of stuff that really shouldn't have been there in the garden, which have now been moved, he found a frog, a toad, and this little fellow. Now this is where it gets interesting. This is a palmate newt, which is the only species of newt found in this part of Devon. And Carl had never seen one before, and because it has a much more pointed and reptilian-looking head, than the smooth newt, which is the common species of newt up where he lives, he immediately thought it was a common lizard. Common lizards used to be found in and around the churchyard in Woolsbury when I was a boy, and last year Mike Davis, my musician friend, found a very dead and very mangled common lizard on the garden path. It had obviously fallen foul of one of the cats, but Although there's circumstantial evidence that they are found in the garden, I'd never seen one. I was mildly disappointed that it wasn't a common lizard, because it would have been very nice to find one in the garden alive. However, I'd never seen a palmate newt before, so this to me was equally as exciting. Earlier in the day, just as Carl was about to put in that wooden ramp, which is designed for hedgehogs to be able to get out of the pond if they fall in, he found a large frog in the pond. And the frog, as soon as it saw Carl, was swimming about in a frantic sort of manner. However, as soon as Carl put in the wooden plank to act as a ramp, the frog made a bee line or a frog line for it, and climbed out and went off it's into the so undergrowth. <laughs> when Carl found the young toad, he decided to see if he could replicate this for the camera. But, like I always say, never worked with children or animals because the toad just sat there in the pond quite happily doing absolutely nothing while Lilith, the black cat, looked on in great interest. Both the newt and the toad were sub-adults, so we know that they're both breeding locally. It's not too much of a mystery where the newt is breeding because they, we know they reproduce in one of the CFZ ponds. However, we have no idea where the toad spawn is. Could it be there's a mysterious Sargasso Sea for toes hidden away somewhere in Walsery. There was a serious and very upsetting scandal earlier in the year when it turned out that North Norfolk District Council had put nets over the face of various cliffs along the Norfolk coastline in order to prevent swifts and sand martins, which had flown all the way from sub-Saharan Africa, from nesting. Nets like these are springing up all over the country at the moment, when everybody from councils to housing developers are trying to stop birds nesting so they can get on with what they perceive as being their lawful duty. Well, I'm very glad to say that despite all of the council's protestations, the upswell of public opinion was so strong that the nets were removed. And coincidentally, the other day, Olivia and my two granddaughters, Evelyn and Iris, were out on the beach watching with great delight these tiny birds building their nests and rearing their young. They're tiny. Yeah. Um, can I say this little babies? Um, Hang on, I'm just doing a video. Um, out, 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 out. I'm really pleased that the people in the CFZ family 
all over the country and indeed all over the world are doing things to do with animal rescue, conservation and all the other things that we cover as well as cryptozoology in this show. So please, if you're watching this show and there's something that you'd like to contribute, please write to me, john at eclipse.co.uk and I really look forward to hearing from you. And now over to Karina for a monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I've always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird. A highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other old world raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment upon the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the Watcher of the Skies. Hello everybody, and before we begin we must welcome Charlotte back to the fold. You pleased right. to be back, Charlotte? Yeah. Well, well sound enthusiastic. <laughs> I have I've got something in my eye. <laughs> right. RSPP Burton Mere Wetlands have confirmed that bearded tits are breeding there for the first <laughs> time. I haven't been able to hold it back, unlike you. RSPB Burton Mere Wetlands have confirmed that bearded tits are breeding there for the first time ever. The bird rely on reed beds to make their home and were much more common throughout the UK, but reed beds are sadly now one of the country's rarest habitats, as many have been drained for development or agriculture. In the northwest, the only place where they have traditionally bred is at RSPB's Leighton Moss Reserve in North Lancashire, but following the arrival of six birds to Burton Mere wetlands last autumn, at least two pairs are now known to have bred for the first time on the D estuary. After a three-year work program by Burton Mere Wetlands to create a reed bed into which volunteers hand-planted over 10,000 reed seedlings, it's culminated in having these bearded tits breeding in the very same reed bed this summer. It is not known exactly where the bearded tits have come from, whether populations elsewhere in the UK or from the Europe, but it's hoped that this is the start of them breeding each year at Burton Mere. A bunting, which was originally thought to be an ortolan or a kretschmars, was spotted at Minsmere at the end of May. Photos eventually confirmed the bird's identity as a female kretschmars bunting, which is a first for Suffolk and the UK mainland. It breeds in Greece, Turkey, Cyprus and the Levant. Whilst it is migratory, wintering in Sudan and northern Eritrea, it is a very rare wanderer to Western Europe. Cat. It was announced at the end of May that a pair of white storks is incubating three eggs at the Neck Estate in West Sussex. A pioneering partnership of private landowners and native nature conservation organisations is working together to help the species return to South East England for the first time in several hundred years as part of the White Stork Project and has been releasing birds at three sites. As well as NEP, free flying white storks have been reintroduced at Wadhurst Park, East Sussex, and Wintersaw Estate in Surrey. The project team was thrilled to find that a pair of storks is attempting to nest in an ancient oak tree at the NEP estate this spring. If the che cheeks, if the chicks and their cheeks successfully fledge, the nest at NEP will be the first successful one in southern England since at least the end of the English Civil War in 1651. The large birds, symbolic of rebirth, are native to the British Isles and evidence suggests that they were once widely distributed. While it is unclear why this spectacular and sociable bird failed to survive in Britain, it is likely that a combination of habitat loss, overhunting and targeted persecution all contributed to their decline. 
Another factor may be that it was persecuted in the Civil War for being associated with the rebellion. The White Stork Project aims to restore a population of at least 50 breeding pairs in southern England by 2030 through a phased release program over the next five years with at least 250 storks to be released at several sites in Sussex and surrounding counties over that time. Saltcoats Beach in Scotland had an unusual visitor towards the end of May when an Australian black swan was spotted. Only four others have ever been reported as living in the wild in Scotland. It is not sure whether the bird had escaped from a zoo or a private collection. Black swans are common in the wetlands of southwestern and eastern Australia and adjacent coastal islands. They were introduced to other countries as ornamental birds in the 1800s but many have escaped and formed stable populations. For example, there's a small population of black swans living on the River Thames in London. A mourning dove was spotted in North Ronaldsay Island at the end of April. It was first thought to be a collared dove until further investigation. <coughs> mourning dove is one of the commonest breeding species across North America. Many are resident, but more northerly populations migrate south in winter. There are four previous occurrences in Britain, with a further three in Ireland, and a single record from the Isle of Man. All but two of these have come since 2007. Something quite interesting from a cryptozoological viewpoint is that mourning doves are the species which are sometimes mistaken for the long extinct passenger pigeon in parts of North America. There are regular reports of passenger pigeons having survived, but the real clincher here is that mourning doves can survive singular or in small groups, where the passenger pigeon was doomed once the enormous flocks began to be hunted, to be hunted away. A rare Harris hawk has been pictured in a Solihull residence garden eating a wood pigeon. It was suspected to have escaped captivity because it also appeared to have a thin leather strap around its leg which could be used by a falconer to tether the bird. The Warwick Road resident says he even tried to catch the hawk with thick gloves and some meat so he could take it back to its owner. Hawks seen in this country have usually escaped from captivity although some wild hawks are establishing themselves in the UK experts say. It is a crime to release the birds deliberately in the UK as they pose a risk to other birds and wildlife, even cats. Nick Moran from the British Trust of Ornithology said the raptors hunt in packs or alone and can have a wingspan of more than one metre. They can easily be trained due to the high intelligence which makes them popular choices for falconers. Escaped hawks have sometimes been known to attack humans and pets according to media reports. The birds are sometimes used to control pests such as pigeons, and this practice was employed recently at Waterloo Station in London. West Midlands Ringing Group member and police sergeant Ben Dolan said sightings of the birds should be reported, and sightings can also be reported to the British Falconers Club. If you do want to report one, there is an email address here which might go on the screen later, so if I go like that and say, here, it might get picked up. Back in 1999, a rare Balon's crake was found in Kent, which was then only the tenth of its kind in Britain to be found. But it wasn't until June this year that Northumberland recorded its first Balon's crake near sea houses at Monk's House Pool. Although they used to breed in Great Britain up to the mid-19th century, the Western European population declined through drainage. These days, this bird's usual breeding habitats are siege... siege? I'm going back to the Civil War now. Habitat are sedge beds in Europe, mainly in the east and across Asia. There has been a recovery in northwestern Europe in recent years with the recolonisation of Germany and the Netherlands and breeding suspected in Britain. An Irish record in 2012 was the first there since the 1850s. The species is migratory, wintering in East Africa and South Asia. It is also a resident breeder in Africa and Australasia and there is a single North American record of this species on Attu Island in September 2000. And that is it for this episode's 
look into wandering birds. And now it is time to go over to Jonathan for his usual look at new and rediscovered species. So it's goodbye from me, it's goodbye from Peanut who is sitting there by Graham the cameraman, and it's goodbye from Charlotte again. Just getting a shot of Peanut. He's just caught the sun's rays on his bottom. Mm. Despite its recognition since the early 1900s, the agamid lizard Pseudocolotes austenia remains known only based on three vouchered specimens from the East Himalayas, and little is known about its general biology. During recent herpetological surveys of Tibet and in China, three specimens of P. austenia from Madog County, southeastern Tibet, including the first juvenile specimen ever vouchered, have been found. Prior to the observations of Pseudocolotes austenia in the field, the species was thought only to be a rare endemic to the southern parts of southern Tibet, and the species was not officially listed as a member of the Chinese herptofauna. However, the newly discovered populations represent a range expansion of about 400 kilometers northeastwards from the species' previous range limits in the East Himalayas. Given the recognized habitat, connectivity and similar environments spanning this region, it is likely that P. Arstania is currently, or once was, distributed continuously across this area. Future survey efforts for this species should focus on habitat to the west in Bhutan. Additional studies of this enigmatic and secretive lizard are needed to better understand its ecology, population densities and full geographic distribution. A new species of pipefish, Leptonotus vincenti, has been described on the basis of 12 specimens found in shallow waters that's less than 2 metres depth of San Antonio Bay, Patagonia, Argentina in the southwest Atlantic Ocean. The species is distinguished from congeners by the combination of characteristics. Although the species has often been mistaken for Leptonotus blanvillianus, most diagnostic characters of the two species differ. Both species are clearly distinguished by their snout length. Blainvillianus has a relatively longer snout than L. vincenti, and the new species is similar to a southwest Pacific species, Leptonotus elevatus. However, the new species differs from this species in that it exhibits a lower number of dorsal fin rays and a relatively longer head. A new species of kite fin shark is described from the Gulf of Mexico in the western North Atlantic Ocean. Based on five diagnostic features not seen on the only other Molluscuama specimen, the holotype of Molluscuama perini, which was captured in the eastern South Pacific Ocean. This new species, Molluscuama mississippiensis, is distinguished from its congener by a putative pit organ located ventrally just posterior of the lower jaw margin centre. Photophores, which are glandular organs that appear as luminous spots on various marine animals and are used for attracting food or for camouflage, irregularly distributed along many areas of the body and ten fewer vertebrae than in Molluscuama parini. The pit organ, by the way, consists of two oversized denticles which cover a small pocket in the skin. At the bottom of this pocket is a collection of sensory hair cells. Many sharks have these pit organs in greater numbers on their backs, sides and lower jaw. The exact function of the pit organ has not yet been determined, but most likely sharks use it to register mechanical stimuli such as water currents. And we have another piece of news for you. 25 years ago I wrote a book called The Smaller Mystery Carnivals of the West Country in which I looked at the evidence for the continued existence of three species of small and carnivore which were popularly thought to be extinct in the region. Amongst these were the pine martin, Martis Martis. I was very excited by my findings. 
but when I tried to share them with representatives of the scientific establishment, including people who had made some fairly major works on Pine Martin biology, I was peremptorily dismissed. Now, as we were putting the final bits of this episode together, a news item came in. A dead Pine Martin, presumably a roadkill, has been found in Mid-Devon. And I'm doing my best not to jump up and down and crow and shout, I told you so. But I did. That's all we have time for in New and Rediscovered for this episode. I'm sure that I've said before how cherry-picking the animals I talk about in this segment of On the Track each month is one of the most difficult jobs that I regularly do. There is such a wide diversity of new species being discovered across our increasingly beleaguered planet that I truly am spoiled for choice. If you are interested in such things, I strongly recommend that you go and check out the Nova Taxa blog, which is where we find most of our information, both for this segment of On the Track and for the new and rediscovered section in Animals and Men. I truly can't recommend it highly enough. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. But first, there's this. And in next month's episode... Well, next month we have Carl Marshall reviewing the, some of the latest big cat sightings. We have, I believe, me and Charlotte looking at some stuff that's been happening at Loch Ness. And we have the return of Wally, the comedy rhinoceros. And then, there's this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, nobody ever thinks it to look at me, but one of my favourite bands is the Pet Shop Boys. And earlier this year, the Pet Shop Boys released a song called Social Media, in which they basically slagged off the subject of social media. And I have to say that basically, most of the time I agree with them entirely because I think social media is facile, irritating and one of those things which is a blot on the 21st century landscape. However, Charlotte, look at Charlotte there, give him a wave Charlotte! Charlotte and all the younger people who are involved with this show, like Louis, who isn't in the room at the moment, and probably Archie, if it wasn't the fact that he's a dog, are all telling me that I have to talk about social media, despite the fact I loathe it. So, social media, if you want to get involved with this show, first of all, if you liked what you'd saw, what you'd saw, what you'd seen, if you liked this show, just put a like by clicking this thingy, or if you want to be um, notified every time we have a new show, you can click this bell ringy thingy thing. Or you can go onto any of these different social media platforms and say how bloody brilliant, how ass and great you think we all are. Or you can visit our Facebook page. Or you can actually do the only thing which I actually understand, which is Twitter. And I have to admit, despite everything, I really rather like Twitter. You can follow me, CFZ John, on Twitter. And now, thank goodness, I have got rid of this subject because it is something that really annoys me. Toodle pip. Okay, was that okay? I believe so. Thank you very much for watching, it's great to be back. I particularly enjoyed looking at the animal remains with Carl and John. A big shout out to John's friend Melanie on Twitter. No, you're not the only teenage girl who's interested in animal remains. At the beginning of July, we'll be at Geekfest in Cornwall. We hope to see you there. We've got all sorts of exciting things coming up, so we hope to see you next month. Goodbye. 
have you noticed that whenever you switch a camera on and point it in my direction, this publicity hungry hound will come up and jump on my lap? Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who helped this time. It was somewhat more complicated than usual, as you'll see in the credits at the end. But I think it's been a pretty good show. But above everything, thank you for coming back, Charlotte. We have missed you so much. There's nothing much for else for me to say. We'll be back in a month's time. We've got all sorts of exciting things in the pipeline. And I don't want to ruin the surprise by telling them about them just yet. So, until next month, be seeing you.